Shalom, peace, in Messiah the Branch. This is February 1st, 2017. Today I am uh, presenting a, a an expose on the Heralds of the Morning prophecy chart by Lois Roden. It's a very important chart. You should study it carefully. It can be found on um, my website, which I will give the uh, link at the end of the video and various other charts that Lois Roden did, all based on time and type of the German and English Reformation by Martin Luther and John Knotts that uh, came out to various dates in the latter days. Uh, in Lois Roden's case, uh, 1977, on both, on both timelines, under Luther and Knotts. And the last date that she gave on this chart was, of course, 1990. She didn't say much about it in, in a field letter, which I'll read at some other time, or I'll add in to the video. She states that the 1990 date was um, the long-awaited acceptance of the Reformation that be was begun by John Knotts in uh, in the English Reformation, and she doesn't give any other details concerning that event. And I have written a study, or, or wrote a study in 1990, uh, about this topic, based on a dream. It was not just an idea; it was a dream. And I'll touch on that very briefly after I get uh, a ways through this uh, expose. The reason I am presenting this is because. mainly the claims of Charles Pace in his document, or his book that he published in 1992, and I repeat, it was published in 1992 because I remember the year very clearly. I was working with Charles at the time. We were in communication multiple times a week, one, two, or three times a week, sometimes more of all the events that were going on at the time. When he wrote his um, syllabus study, his overall study on the Divine Family. And I have written, published copies of that study, uh, multiple copies. Uh, I will share those on video uh, in this, this presentation. Uh, right now, I'm going to show you, uh, this is this website is Charles Pace website, the two branches. Uh, this is the section under his main publication, Jesus Christ and His Righteousness. Uh, the loud cry of the seventh angel. We have the claim of the seventh angel, uh, ten chapters. Here he shows that um, he's publishing this to commemorate the 150-year anniversary of the Great Day of Atonement, which began October 22, 1844. He states here clearly, by the way, here is the, um, the cover of the book, and I'll show you my, my own copies here uh, momentarily, but I'll show you what he states here emphatically uh, for all the world to see. He says, this book, here in the second paragraph, this book was first started to be written at Passover 1981, and its contents was grad continually added uh, to as the Spirit progressively revealed the ideas and concepts of the Heavenly Family to the writer and messenger. Major dates of revelation and expansion were 1981, 84, 1990, and 1993. This message of the revelation of Jesus Christ and His righteousness was both a warning and a judgment during the purification of the church from her, from her apostate leadership. Now, he gives the specific dates here, 1981, 84, 1990, and 1993. Only one of those dates is, as I like to call it, uh, comes up on the 430-year uh, prophecy of Ezekiel 4. And that date is 1990. Now you can't do a shotgun application here. It has to be one or the other of these various dates. 
1981 is invalid because, um, as I'm going to show in my second video, uh, Lois Roden was, in fact, beginning to reveal the Divine Daughter, the fullness of the Divine Family, and what is she terms herself a fourth member of the Godhead. I'm going to prove that from her very own writings uh, themselves. But right now, um, in 1981, Charles Pace didn't write anything. Uh, in 1984, he wrote a, um, um, so a study outline or, or a study um, which was not titled the same title, uh, Revealing the Divine Family or the divine, divine Daughter, as if he himself was revealing it outside of what Lois Roden was teaching. And he was not. Finally, he comes to the 1990 date here um, and states here emphatically, right here underneath this paragraph, originally published at Pentecost 1990 by Living Waters Branch Publication, Living Waters Publications, uh, Gadsden, Alabama. Okay. And um, total falsification of the facts because not only was I there, and I remember very clearly, and I testify of this under penalty of divine perjury or perjury before the recording angel. This is exactly as I remember as working with Charles Pace at the time. There comes a point working with someone if, if, if someone starts lying you just have to you have to separate yourself ultimately. But he clearly states here what his dates of publication are and that this was some kind of a progressive revelation. <clears throat> the ideas were progressive for sure but his publication was not. He did not publish this as he states here, originally published at Pentecost 1990. Now I'm going to prove that with hard evidence. Okay. Here is my copy, uh, one of my copies of the publication by Charles Pace uh, on my desk. This is actually the second version which came out a few weeks or a few months later and I can't tell exactly when because he doesn't date this version. Here is the um, spiral bound blank page and then another blank page before the table of contents. I have a little beam of sunlight coming in on this, so that's where that extra light's coming, that shaft of light's coming from. And um, after the title page, which is uncustom and uncustomary with publications in general, for at least professionally done one, professionally published, they usually have a title page with date or whatever, date information, author, etc. As you can see, he gives a explanation of the, the cover picture, nice picture and a quote uh, from the Living Bible, John 3, 14 through 16. And then he goes right into the preface about the revelation of Jesus Christ, the loud cry of the seventh angel, okay? now. As we continue on, page after page, there is no title page further th th further on in this publication. And um, he starts chapter one, the eighteen eighty eight message, and onward from there. Uh, one thing I did notice about this is that all through this, this is about, of course, the revelation of the divine family, as Charles Pace claims to, um, it has been revealed to him, uh, but really it was revealed by Lois Roden. Not once in this document, in this book, does he mention Lois Roden. And um, 
or her message. He doesn't even mention Ben Rodens. He does quote from Ellen White extensively and Jones and Wagner, the 1888 message. But once again, there is um, nothing here that would tie him really to the branch message. That's just a observation. But my main point here is in this version, there is no title page. There is just a table of contents. And the blank page before. Now the first version I received, and I remember it very clearly, is this version here. And we will examine this one carefully. As a the original photo on the front, which he used at the, at the end of it as well. Loud cry of the seventh angel. I open this one up as the original one I received from Charles Pace, and it has what all books should have: a title page. Um, title information, publication information, date of publication, location of publish, publishing. And if you want to pause the video and look at this, read this, you may do so. And uh, it is clearly stated that it was published April 18th, 1992 at Passover time by Living Waters Branch of Righteousness Living Waters Publications Gadsden, Alabama Today Charles Pace is attempting to state and again, once again this is the same exact book the first one I read and his table of contents is the next page Uh, if there are any changes, they're minor ones. It's the same basic uh, publication. Starts off chapter 1, the 1888 message. And um, the various other uh, graphics he has in here that are... Um, this is published on Charles' website. He may have updated a few things. Uh, the main thing he has updated is uh, date of publication, which is complete falsehood. Uh, again, I'm testifying before the recording angel. This is exactly what I remember, and I'm testifying of the truth. At the time, I was supporting Charles, working with him, and um, doing the um, helping him extensively in what he was teaching and publishing. So please take a, a few moments to look at this, look this over and compare it with what Charles states on his web page, the two branches, under the revelation of Jesus Christ and the date of publication. If someone can't get that right, um, what else is going on here? What other untruths are being published here? This, this publication was in no way published in 1990 at any time during 1990. One thing about the hand of providence when it comes to the fulfillment of the 1990 date that Lois Roden published as the last signature date of a message that bore the divine signature and time and type of the Reformation not only according to um, Abraham, but also of the Reformation itself, which was a signature issue and always has been in the Rod message and the Branch message. Now the importance of this that everyone should be aware of, and the reason I am uh, presenting this and exposing this 
is to, I, I don't like when someone misrepresents something, particularly something that I had a part in, and something that was revealed to me in 1990. Here is the original version of my 1990 Passover study. It can be viewed in its 2012 re-edit on this site here, theadventmovement.net, under New Studies section, go down to the various studies, here to Passover 1990, and um, this study comes up. It's the same exact study, or nearly so, of what was presented in the 1990 study. And the important thing to note about this, two important points. First of all, date of publication. Let me open the first page. That's a fly page, uh, date page, or rather title page. And second page does give uh, I was working with Charles Pace at the time. Uh, that's why his address appears at the bottom of this title page. But it is dated April, or copyrighted, Passover April 1990. This is when the events in this book took place during the month of April. However, the uh, going back here toward the... Um, I can see this was a, a rather lengthy book, but somewhat tedious to read, particularly with the early print uh, printing machines we had at the time, 1990, um, small print. So that's why I re -ed part of the reason I re-edited it into this form here, digitally published now, so everyone can read what's in it. It's, um, I got it down to 59 pages, and it's all based upon the 1990 date and the Heralds of the Morning chart. I didn't invent it. This, is, this was the uh, announcement of Lois Irene Scott Roden, and about something coming. She predicted judgment in various qu quotes and comments she, she made. Uh, particularly audio uh, tapes she made in the early 80s and late 70s. But getting back here to the actual date of publication or the finishing date of this study, I worked on it right after Passover, on the re after we had I'd returned to the uh, United States. I worked on it and um, I didn't finish it until, see if I can get a good close up here, there. I'll try to hold it as steady as I can or move the camera up to it. Uh, as I state here, letter finished July 1st, 1990. Not focusing as well as I'd like it to. Uh, Sunday, which happened to be that year Canadian Dominion Day, um, as I stay here exactly 16 years to the day after the Lord first came to me. But I've dated it, uh, ended up dating it July 1st of all things. I didn't even real recognize the date at the time, but um, I got it right as it was published. Um, Doug Mitchell's claim to 1990 was not uh, recognized and published until 1992, according to his, and I'll deal with that either this video or the next one. This one is dealing mainly with what Charles Pace teaches. This is a, um, uh, on the third trip to Israel, which is where this uh, overall study was generated from, uh, Charles Pace uh, attended me. Uh, we went um, pretty much together on our flights and arrived in Tel Aviv and I go through in this book and in my edited version, my uh, digital version, all the different events that took place 
during that final third trip uh, to Israel. The reason we went on those trips and was prompted to go on those trips, trips in the uh, late 80s was because Sister Teresa Moore Sister Teresa Moore brought the attention of uh, several of us to this chart in 19, um, end of or late 88, early 1989, stating that we needed to make some preparations to determine what the Lord was going to do in 1990 because uh, something important was going to happen. And she taught all the branch believers that she knew of, and she knew all of them pretty much, to study this chart and all pray and decide what we were going to do. We had thought about meeting somewhere beginning Passover 1989, somewhere in the United States, somewhere in the central United States. But as we prayed more and more about it, it came to our attention. I don't know how, but it came to our attention we, uh, that we, we should go to Jerusalem for that date. We even considered going to uh, Waco, Texas to uh, warn Vernon Howell and his group that lived at New Mount Carmel at the time. I didn't like that idea, but I was willing to go. But the Holy Spirit directed us to go to Jerusalem for Passover 1989, which we in fact did. Myself, uh, Lola Nagaman from Arizona, a longtime branch, and Teresa Moore. We rented a car and we drove around Jerusalem and uh, went to the Mount of Olives. We went to visit the grave site of uh, Ben Roden and Lois Roden on the Mount of Olives. Uh, discovered that Lois Roden's grave was unfinished and at that point immediately contacted the groundskeeper to see about getting a stone slab put upon uh, Lois's um, uh, resting place the same as it was on Ben Roden's. I don't have a, a digital picture of that. I do have a picture of it and I'll share that at some other time. Um, actually, I have it right here. No, it's not there. It was put put differently. I published that differently. Oh, here it is. I actually published it in the um, this is a copy of a photo. This is Charles Pace and myself, uh, Passover 1990. The grave site on the uh, left as, a, as you're facing is um, Lois Roden. The one on the right that Charles putting the um, uh, olive branch on is Ben Roden's. Ben Roden's was completed shortly after his transport to uh, Jerusalem for interment from Waco, from his uh, his mausoleum space in Waco to the Mount of Olives after he'd gotten approval and clearance to be buried there. And it's quite a process. Uh, back in 90 or eight, 1982, I believe, 1982, Lois Roden did do a field letter on that. I won't go over that now. But Lois's grave site on the left or on the right, excuse me, on your left, as you view this, did not have the, the stone marker or slab on it. It just had a, um, a, a stone border border on it. So, uh, on the first trip to Israel, Teresa Moore and myself um, set to getting this taken care of with the same inscription, only with Lois's chosen Hebrew name, which is Rahel, um, and Ben Roden's scriptural name was, um, I believe, Jacob, and it's written on the stones here in Hebrew. And we leave marker little small stones on the on the grave uh, to show that the you know visitors have come and repaid your, their respects. On the second trip, you know, I I, I had paid to have this done. Uh, Teresa Moore had the wording and the impetus to make it happen, and um, I paid to have it done out of my own uh, pocket uh, because um, in Israel the graves are not very deep. It's very rocky soil and they don't they don't bury them deep. 
This is why they need to have a uh, stone cover as most, for basically all graves there do have a stone cover. This is at the very top of the Mount of Olives, right in that wall next to Lois's grave is the retaining wall of the Intercontinental Hotel just above it. So it's a very nice area. The, the view looking to Jerusalem opposite this view is rather breathtaking. But this was done by T Teresa Moore and myself. Um, without Teresa, nothing would have gotten done. And I honor her for all that she did. She's still alive today. I'm thankful for that. Teresa Moore was Lois Roden's best friend in the message, particularly the last two years of her life. Teresa would tell me, has told me more than once, sometimes Lois would call her two or three times a day in her last couple of years because she didn't have much company or support even from her family. And um, she told me that, uh, and of course when Lois died, in 1986, November, Lois had a will that she that was run through the courts there in Waco. Uh, some of it was updated, but she made it very specific in her will, which I have a copy of, as well and uh, as well as Doug Mitchell did. Doug Mitchell actually sent me my copy. That uh, she wanted Teresa Moore and Ermine Sampson to carry on with the publishing work. Whatever that appointing meant, it was essentially just to do the publishing work, whatever, you know, republishing the branch writings and keeping the people together until heaven revealed more of what was to come next, which came in 1989 and 1990. More on that some other time. But um, Teresa Moore was one of the two appointed ones to, uh, by Lois to carry on, to keep the people together and which she did for many, many, quite a, quite a few years. And uh, so this, this was a time of great importance and I was very blessed and touched to be a part of it. So I didn't understand at the time that I wrote the um, 1990 report and also termed a revelation and report from Jerusalem what its full meaning was. In this book, I clearly, excuse me, start out with the dream I was given. I called it my dear dream at the time. This is page, uh, the very beginning of the book, page, uh, page two. And it's dated pretty much throughout the book carefully. But this is the only publication that was produced in 1990. Charles Pace, Pace produced nothing. Doug Mitchell produced nothing. Like I say, Doug backdated his claim from 1992, which I will show in a different video um, about the nature of his claim at the Indianapolis General Conference, uh, which a pre-meeting took place July 1st, uh, 1990. And he makes certain claims on that, which I'll deal with in another video, uh, perhaps the next one. In this particular uh, dream, I'll go over it. Hold on. In my digital version of the 1990 publication, my dream I share on uh, page 37 on the original publication. It was on uh, page two. I began that right after the introduction. So if you want to read it, go to page 37 of the digital version on the adventmovement.net website and get my fuller understanding of it, my fuller take on it. I will read it briefly. It's just one paragraph. I'll skip my introductory comments. It states here, uh, I stated, um, starting here, the dream I was given was brief but very profound. Um, this was about a month before the third trip to Israel, where only uh, Teresa Moore and a few others went, and then I, I was, uh, uh, 
I went with Charles Pace. We were both in Jerusalem at the same time. I stated here, the dream I was given was brief, but I felt very profound. I was in a wooded area on the saddle or crest of some beautiful mountain on a sunny early spring day. I was in a clearing near a stand of trees, pine trees or evergreens. I was with several other people, about a handful really. I did not recognize them in particular. There were patches of snow around various places on the ground. I was there standing in one of the patches of snow looking at a set of large antlers laying there in the snow. In the dream it perplexed me as to the meaning of the antlers. I was um, seemingly conscious of the perplexity of why there would be antlers laying in snow like that. And yet I was with another group, I was with a group of people but I had separated from them temporarily. Go on here. I was standing by myself looking at the antlers when one or two of the other people a short distance away called to me excitedly telling me they had found the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. I thought that was interesting news, but before going to see their find, I, look, I, look, I took one more look at the curious antlers in the snow in some consternation as to what they meant. Then I turned and looked at the few people gathering to look at the tables of stone, joined together as one laying on the ground in a clear piece of ground without any snow, near a large tree, large, uh, that is, pine tree. Uh, the other people were quite amazed at the find of the tablets, but I did not go to join them in my dream. From my position and perspective, looking over there, where they were all standing, I noticed that just a few yards behind all of them was an old graveyard really just one grave. I could see that the tablets of the law had been knocked off of a rather tall gravestone, about six feet tall. The tablets were knocked off the monument and clear of the graveyard near a large pine tree. I saw that the tablets were removed from the gravestone. It seemed to me by some divine act, not by the hand of man. The tablets remain, remained intact and unbroken. I called out to the group, uh, group that the tablets uh, of the law that they were so amazed to have found had been recently knocked off the tall gravestone. In other words, I was telling them that those tablets came from that gravestone. For lack of a better word, a description which none of them had and then, my attention turned again to the antlers in the snow. I was mystified. I had wondered had hunters come and killed a deer, or elk or a reindeer, and left the antlers behind. I thought that could not be the case since the antlers are the prize of any hunt and would never be left behind. Uh, oftentimes, um, ant well, antlers always fall off on their own eventually, later in the year. Uh, of the male uh, elk or a reindeer and um, so they just kept they're just lying there until so, unless someone finds them and oftentimes hikers in the woods will find antlers and take them home as a prize continuing on I thought that could be the could not be the case since the antlers are the prize of any hunt and would never be left behind I eliminated that eliminated that possibility I understand or understood at the time that the antlers were part of a natural event with symbolic, prophetic, divine implications. I thought at the time that the antlers in the snow and the tablets of the law were obviously powerful symbols, but the antlers had me puzzled. This is basically all there was to the dream. I did not consider the dream for many days and until a, a week or two later when I happened to see an educational program one morning of course was very providential. I understood that the antlers are like horns, a symbol, and that horns represent powers, typically earthly powers, but the horns on the altars in the sanctuary represent the four divine powers of heaven, 
antlers also, it should be noted, have four corners. I eventually wondered if the dream was telling me something about a divine transfer of power and ultimately a transfer of power from heaven to earth or a change in administration in the heavenly sanctuary. I'll stop reading there and just a few other comments. You can read the rest of this uh, on your own um, on the website. But this was the basis on which the 1990 uh, third trip uh, was based upon. There was coming a change of administration in 1990. And as I show here in my book um, if something if the Lord is about to do something he announces it and as I state in this book in another place that the um, um, coming of the judicial throne of Ezekiel 1 is was the initial uh, impetus of this third trip. Uh, it was actually the impetus for all three trips. Charles Pace came along only on the third trip when uh, Lo when Teresa Moore informed him what we were doing. Uh, when he showed up her, her doorstep in, Pensil in Downingtown, Pennsylvania uh, in December of 1989 at Hanukkah time. So this idea of a coming, uh, Christ coming, and turned out to be coming in judgment, was already part of our thinking, uh, even at the very first trip. Uh, Teresa Moore and um, others of us that went the first and second trip, we would go up to the Mount of Olives to keep the daily, um, the daily emblems, uh, twice a day, for almost all of the trip. We did the best we could trying to get up there. It wasn't too far from where we were staying, although that's debatable. We were staying just outside of Jerusalem at the time. So my point here is that the impetus and the significance of this trip was based on prophetic understanding that was given to me. And although Charles Pace picked up on it quickly, as he does with so many things, uh, Charles Pace did not give me this dream, nor did he... Um, stimulate this dream in my mind and at any time this is uh, so this is why I'm trying to I'm making a case here of which testimony of 1990 is is or should be believed one was clearly published and carefully documented at Passover 1990 and July 1st uh, 1990 as well and it just so happens that this um, 1990 date was um, based upon the July 1st date and I didn't realize that at the time Lois Roden gives that here somewhere or in her publication uh, when John Knotts was uh, his reformation was officially recognized in uh, Scotland, in the Scottish Reformation. I don't know if it's on this date or this chart or not, and uh, but it is in another location, which happens to be the date I finished this publication. When I was finished with it, I sent it off to Charles Pace for edit on a uh, three and a half inch floppy disk or a uh, hard disk, um, an A drive disk, so he could go over it and then send it back to me so I could print it and publish it. This was published and mailed from California to the entire branch field, including New Mount Carmel. I believe I, I, I remember sending two copies to them, and I sent one to Carmen Roden in Israel, where she lived at the time, so she could send share with her family. So this, this was sent out extensively. Um, and it was part of, I believe, um, Teresa Moore's assistance to bring this date to our attention, as she did. 
uh, there was some controversy at the time uh, between us because of Charles Pace and his claims. Uh, part of the reason I re-edited or edited this in 2012 was not only to cut it down and add graphics and to make it uh, published in a digital format, but also to change my position uh, on Charles Pace and his leadership from then uh, till the present day. So each one, each of you may decide on your own which testimony is true here. Whether what Charles, Pub Charles Pace published in 1992, which is clearly dated on the title page of this that publication there, or this publication, which was not only published, uh, written and published uh, late spring and summer of 1990, but more so revealed in 1990 as a new truth, a new revelation of what was happening to transition from in the judgment of the living from the judicial phase under Lois Roden to the executive phase of the branch that brought a literal executive judgment, fire and sword to New Mount Carmel, Waco, Texas in 1993, exactly three years from the publication date of this study revealed in 1990 and published in 1990 and I wrote all of it yours truly wrote all of this I sent it to Charles to be edited and I'm not sure if he added anything or not he probably cleaned up some of my um, things that needed to be clarified but there you have it. You decide who's telling the truth, what was published when, and what should be our focus in this uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of the Divine Daughter, her work. And in the next video, I will begin, um, I will either do a follow-up on this, and then the one following that will be a, a reading of this tract by Lois Roden, The Wife of God, that was published at Passover, 1981. She actually wrote it early in 1981, and then released it and mailed it out by Passover 1981 as well as her uh, study tract, study book in their image and we will both of these were published in 1981 spring summer or spring anyway and understand for sure who revealed, who began to reveal the revelation of the fourth member of the Godhead in the branch. Because there have been many misrepresentations to this reality and that revelation given through Sister Lois Roden. So that's will be in the next video or after the follow-up. So I'll conclude there. Thank you for your attention. Pray about these things and study to show yourself approved. In the name of the branch.